Please enter your conference access code followed by the pound key. This menu will repeat. You entered 608990. If this is correct, press 1. To re enter your access code, press 2. There are 1. Other callers on the call. Conference up. And let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's event, Think India, the discussion with Vinay Rai. This event is sponsored by the Ash Institute for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And I'd like to start things off by passing the event off to the director of the Ash Institute, Goa Rizvi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I imagine it isn't morning everywhere, although it is a very fine morning here in Cambridge. Uh, my name is Gohar Rizvi. Uh, from the list, I, I notice I have a number of old friends who have also logged on. And uh, first, let me start by saying how very, very grateful I am that you have taken time to join us online for this conversation this morning. Uh, the global network uh, has been uh, in operation for a while, but this is the first time that we are uh, uh, do, uh, doing a discussion on India. And when I say it is the first time, I hope it is the first of many, many more times uh, that we will do this. And after the event, uh, if you want to write to us with your thoughts, suggestions, and ideas, uh, I promise you we, we will follow up on all those suggestions and ideas. Let me say very, very uh, quickly a couple of words about the Ash Institute. The Ash Institute was set up at Harvard about four years ago with a dual purpose. First, it was to make, uh, to help make governments effective, innovative, and problem solving, and also to make democratic institutions around the world uh, stronger. And that's what we have tried to do. And one of the uh, many things that we do is we work through what is what we call a global network of government innovators. Uh, we have some well over 8,000 members. Uh, in over a hundred uh, 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 countries. And this online event is a part of several other things we do. We also have a global network which meets physically both in the U.S., in Cambridge, and around uh, uh, the world. Uh, we'll be very, very happy to share more information with you, include you in our global network meeting. In other words, basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is Ash Institute is a resource uh, uh, that is at your disposal. And, and we would greatly love to work and uh, share our uh, uh, work uh, with you. Today, uh, uh, in this talk, we have uh, 70, uh, uh, 17, uh, uh, people from 17 different U.S. states have uh, signed in, as indeed have people from 19 US, U.N. states and more than uh, uh, t uh, 10 countries. And the reason why we are here is to talk about uh, uh, Vinay Rai's uh, new book, Think uh, uh, India. Many of you know him from his earlier work. Uh, uh, he, he has published a number of uh, uh, books uh, before. He is one of India's, uh, at least he was one of India's prominent industrialists before he retired to a world of philanthropy and promoting uh, social justice and uh, all sorts of other uh, uh, good work. Uh, Binet is also a friend of the Ash Institute. Uh, with Binet, we are running a meeting of the global network towards the end of this mon month in Delhi, where we will launch the South Asia Forum of uh, the global network. Uh, now, uh, many of you uh, know uh, Vinay, but let me just read very briefly two or three lines from his bio. Vinay Rai is an Indian industrialist and philanthropist. He is also president and founder of Rai Foundation and Rai University. The Rai Foundation is dedicated to improving the quality of education at all levels in India. Vinay was educated at Delhi University in India and the MIT in the United States, and he is the former chairman and CEO of the Usha Group, a large Indian company 
that includes telecom and steel business. But as I said, uh, in the last uh, eight, nine years, Vinay has been solely dedicated to philanthropic work. Now, his new book, which some of you will have already seen, others will have seen reviews of it, uh, is a fascinating uh, uh, book which provides an exceptionally engaging look at the complexities and vast potentials of modern India. Based on his personal experiences in business and his interactions with leaders in politics, government, religion, and the corporate world, Vinay and his co-author Simon are unabashedly optimistic that India will emerge as a world leader and vital partner, not competitor to the U.S. in advancing democracy and promoting peace and prosperity. Their, certainly, their certainty is tempered by a realization of the seemingly intractable problems of the poor and the dispossessed. But the authors have confidence that the same drive, determination, and competitiveness of the young Indians to fulfill the destiny will enable their country to overcome India's poverty and constraints. Think India serves as a valuable opening in educating Americans on modern India, the opportunities, the challenges, the shared interests, and the future. Now, with these few words, uh, I, I will end my uh, uh, opening remarks. I may come back with questions and also uh, say that I really very much hope we will be able to remain in touch and you will uh, email us with your ideas and your thoughts about how Ash Institute uh, uh, might work with you. So with those few words, once again, most, most grateful thanks for joining in. And uh, let me now pass to my friend, Vinay. Vinay, good morning. Thank you, Gaur. That was a very nice introduction, a little more flattery than it should be. But OK, thanks a lot. And good morning to all of you in the United States, and a good evening in India. Um, it's a nice opportunity for me to bring forth to you uh, ideas about what India is and what it is for both uh, the American people and obviously the Indian people as well. It's the rise of the world's next superpower and what it means to every American. Uh, just a little bit about uh, what India is all about for those who uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about that, but we are the world's largest democracy, 1.1 billion people in their terms. We are the 10th largest GDP, but on power purchasing parity, we are the 5th largest. And we have a mix of almost all religions, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Persians, Jews, just about everybody. And in an English-speaking population, we have just about as many uh, people speaking English in India as there are in the United States. Demographics are very interesting, and as the statistics show, by the year 2020, we would have the 50% of the youth under the age of 25 will be in India, and that really makes for a very large thing. I just wanted to bring this up for you that we also have one of the world's most beautiful women, Ashwarya Rai, who happens to share the last name with me. <laughs> Unfortunately, not a relation. I wish it was. Uh, India is the fastest growing free market, 9.5% last year unshackled after years of foreign rule and brush with socialism uh, when we were more aligned with the left. But now it's growing very rapidly, the second largest mobile subscriber base at 250 million, growing at the rate of 100 million a year. We produce the largest number of movies in the world. We are home to 37 of the 80 CMMI level 5 software companies. And very interestingly, Indian companies are now acquiring more assets abroad. It was 28 billion last year, 20 billion this year, and uh, the net effort FDI last year was only 6.1 billion. And if you really take into account the real wealth of the people, part of it may be unaccounted. Uh, we have more millionaires than in India than anywhere else in the world. It's also an economy that has many, many billionaires now, and the Forbes mag magazine listed 40 Indian billionaires with a net worth of 137 billion, second only to the United States in the number of billionaires. The GDP is continuing to grow, and what is astounding is that it is virtually in all sectors of the economy and not just in IT, as some people would make it out to be. <coughs> That's on 
the IT sector obviously is growing. Surprisingly also now India is the lowest cost producer of automobiles in the world, which seems quite surprising for a nation, you know, that uh, was considered uncompetitive in the manufacturing sector. And India's growth is certainly bizarre from all angles. It is going from top down and uh, to the low end agriculture. For the American people, I think uh, one of the best things is that they can really fall in love with India and its people because both of us share the same values of freedom, fraternity, tolerance, free enterprise, and respect. It's unfortunate that the Americans have really no idea about India except what they read in the newspapers about its poverty, bewildering religions, its tigers, and elephants. And I do hope that one day you know, a lot more people from America will come and actually see India in all its diversity of culture, philosophy, of well-being, abundance, and happiness, and which can really fire the American mind looking to go beyond their wealth in search for a larger meaning for life. And India is a place where you can actually make a lot of money and still have a good time, have fun, and be a part of the growth story for yourself. India does not belong to the Indians as much as America really does not belong to the Americans, it belongs to the world. And why India? It's an interesting thought of why you should be looking at India. It's because of its people. It's all about people, and people around the world would love the Indian people's vibrancy, its friendly, open society, and its culturally rich and uh, environment offering a huge benefit and a path towards personal happiness. India has invested a lot in education and will continue to do so, and that is also a skill that is very important. And India has an advantage because uh, of its innovation and creativity in making custom design goods for a growing, finicky, but demanding global customers. And therefore, India has that ability to look at things in a larger perspective. Indians grassroots ability, even at village level, what I call Jugaad, it means multitasking, multiprocessing to survive at all costs and the challenge to meet survival brings out the best in them. A slumbering elephant awakens. Every sector of the economy is growing and we still uh, need a lot more construction, we need a lot more infrastructure, we need massive investments in power, road, everything, and all of this is leading to a huge boom in the economy. The consumer demand is growing, and unlike China, sometimes we do like to compare ourselves with China. The China's demand comes from, uh, you know, first doing a lot of manufacturing and then expecting demand to grow. But in India, the consumer demand is at every t moment of the time outstripping production. So it is a demand-led growth and not a top onwards. So. New drivers of growth, it will be basically the rural markets, which will still grow substantially. India's diversity in manufacturing and its quick response to changing demands will lead to greater efficiency and innovation. And India has a presence even in the entertainment, media, and the liter uh, literature world. And obviously in yoga and in travel and everything, it's a great place to be. There's a very interesting question of uh, strategic interests of the United States now converging with those of India. And, uh, you know, the togetherness between United States and India is part of a larger American strategy of having India as a counterbalance, and this is my firm belief as a growing threat of a growing threat to a non-transparent, potentially aggressive and menacing China with dreams of global dominance. And a uh, lot of U.S. corporates are now getting a little scared of the larger investments in China and in a non-transparent way they are trying to uh, uh, divert U.S. policy towards themselves, and I'm sure the Ch American people don't like that. Uh, India also offers a great ability to fight the America's global war on terror, which Indians have been fighting now for the last 50 years themselves. And the United States is really wanting to tap into the skill of the entrepreneur mind of the Indian people. Indians remain globally very competitive in research and development, innovation and creativity, and American companies are already using that talent and uh, have set up large research bases in the country. We have an increasingly important growing consumer market and an ability to deliver custom design large and important manufacturing base, especially in specialized engineering goods, automobiles, and high value end goods 
unlike China, which is more specialized in the lower value and chains. And of course, it's uh, an important destination for leisure, entertainment, medical tourism, and well-being, and the strategic defense interests to protect the energy and trade routes coincide with those of the United States. One of the things you have to really understand about India uh, and uh, how uh, the philosophy unites this crazy country where there is so much diversity that it is unbelievable. According to me and according to a lot of people in India, it is a firm belief in destiny, a belief in the will of God, and a respect for our duty, and all being our great unifying strength that leads to greater resilience. We are also home to the greatest cultural and linguistic diversity, leading to greater tolerance and acceptance. And I won't go into the details of our concepts of karma and dharma, which really are the twin pillars on which our mindset works. As I say, you don't have to mind your P's and Q's in India, in, in you have to mind your D's and K's. The power and paradoxes of the Indian mind, we have a lot of pe people that are poor, it's uh, over 500 million people, yet there is a feeling of abundance and well-being even among the 800 million that are not so well off. There is a great resilience. I'll give you just one example of the 9-11 in the United States. Uh, where really the psychic of the American people was shattered and it took them a long time to get back to normal. Whereas in Delhi, in uh, the Pavli, which is equivalent to your Christmas, we had 10 blasts in the major markets in New Delhi and uh, lots of people died and the markets were devastated to some extent. But within two hours of the bombing, the markets reopened and the people were back in the streets shopping for the Diwali which was a huge way of telling the terrorists, sorry you guys, we are out here and we are not going to be spared by what you do and we will fight you through sheer resilience of our own people. The other Jugard instance I'm giving you is that of New Orleans floods versus those of Mumbai floods. Mumbai is our uh, capital financial center. In New Orleans it took more than 21 days to get the electricity on and get the power on. In Mumbai, we were flooded with more than 10 feet of water, but within 24 hours, the electricity board was able to put the power on. Obviously, they short-circuited a lot of safety regulations, but they had the city working again, and in two days' time, all the people were back in their offices, some of them wading through two feet of water. It's an underlying oneness, a shared belief in the fairness of the supreme power in the face of massive diversity, differences in thought, attitudes, food, clothing, and just about everything else that unites the Indian people. There are some key Indian attitudes uh, about uh, India and what it's uh, doing, but uh, obviously a uh, few of them is that we do have joint families and therefore privacy is something, you know, which we share less of. So if we have less than 10 people, we say nobody is at home. You know, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we say very few thank yous, but we accept kindness and will return it one day. And therefore, we don't feel the need for saying thank you at every moment. And these are some things I learned from my time in the United States of how many people were saying thank you, you know, and uh, it was shocking to us uh, saying thank yous even to your parents or to your children. Uh, but there are attitudes and you have to learn to them. Yes, we are not very much sticklers of time, so in the practical trips I've said, you know, Indian standard time is being an hour or so late or early for that matter, and we are in no real hurry, so we are, we take our time over things. But these are also changing as we get more global and stuff like that. I did bring in my book a point, you know, where Thomas Friedman had talked about the world is uh, flat, you know, in his very famous book. And I disagree with him in the sense that if the world was flat, every country, because of the technology, would be now prospering as the same way. But you see Africa, you see Latin America, Middle East, not prospering that much. So I believe it's the ability of the people to use technology that makes the major difference and not technology by itself. And it is therefore always a people's game like everywhere else in the world. A little bit of the Indian history, we have had more than 2,000 years of foreign invasion and foreign rule, starting from the Islamic, the French, and the British, which have left a legacy, both good and bad, the good being that we are a united nation country now, and we have the English language, the bad being that we were uh, plundered enough and uh, lost all our uh, you know, wealth, uh, most of it, 
and also had got into a mind that was subjugated as that of a slave. So we really need a little more time to get out of that kind of a slave mindset and look at ourselves with the right place in the world. A lot of questions sometimes are asked about why the Soviet states, why did India as a democracy go towards communism? And Indians by nature are very, very democratic, both in their uh, individual philosophy and as a nation. And so it was really one of the greatest mishaps of history that the two largest democracies, U.S. moving towards a military-controlled Pakistan because they wanted to set up spying bases in, uh, for Russia and China, and India moving towards the communist Russia for protecting Kashmir through the Soviet veto because the United States was pushing with uh, Pakistan for a plebiscite in Kashmir. And therefore, we had the last 50 years of history marred by suspicion on both sides of, with uh, wrong intentions. Uh, and therefore, a case of false hopes and missed opportunities. But now that is getting redressed, and uh, India and U.S. are now really working together. The biggest of them is the nuclear treaty, which is really good for both the countries, and uh, it will be very interesting to see how the relationships take forth. India has a lot of growing uh, muscle around the world as it is maturing, and India is finding its own balance with other nations, whether it's Israel or the Arab world, Southeast Asia, or even Pakistan, Russia, and China, and the European Union. India has a lot to offer in tourism, but I'm not going to go over that because I'm sure lots of books have already been written about tourism, but we have some incredible places, and I just thought I'll show you some slides of the famous Taj Mahal, which all of you love to see, uh, Hawa Mahal, which was a very architectural wonder, lot of archaeology and the hills, which has some very beautiful places to see. Uh, just before closing, uh, and uh, then wanting to get to your answers, questions and answers, which is very important, we do have a, a scale of two Indias, one that is super rich, one that is super poor, and uh, attaching to itself some insurmountable problems, but we are facing them and looking at uh, them head on. There are therefore two Indias, one that is very progressive and forward looking and the other India that is still poor and both need to meet one day. And inclusive growth for all of us is a very, very important challenge which India is facing in all its aspects. And the issues that plague India are both in education, in healthcare, in drinking water, sanitation, infrastructure, uh, the inequality, the uh, emphasis on productivity in agriculture, reforms in the financial markets, in the judiciary, and in women empowerment. And the list can go on and on. And sometimes you think, why in, with all these problems with a country like India ever become a superpower? But the sheer will of the people defines that. This is a little bit about just showing you the kind of uh, traffic in the heart of the capital in New Delhi, where you see all kinds of traffic and a huge, huge bottleneck. But that's a good thing. It means that the country is growing much faster uh, and very fast, and then uh, we will catch up. This is Mumbai. And uh, finally saying what's ahead for the American people and for India. Together we can create a world based on harmony, oneness of humanity, where religion does not divide, and where we can all be very friendly and together expand and grow the market for prosperity for all. Thank you. And that's it. And now if there are any questions, I'll take the questions. There are plenty of questions <laughs> waiting for me. <laughs> uh, I can do them. Uh, Vinay, uh, this is Gohar Rizvi again. Uh, Vinay, uh, there are a large number of questions coming in. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, those of uh, those who have signed in are very engaged, and they want to start a conversation. So thank you for your introductory comment. Uh, one of the things, given your own background in management, one of the questions that has come up is what sort of role do you envisage for the Indi uh, in, uh, institutes of management in India, India's growth and development? Well, you know, <coughs> the management institutes have a huge responsibility because as India grows and becomes more global, we are requiring hundreds and thousands of managers. And the mindsets of managers having a killer instinct to work out and uh, be a part of the global world is very important because under the Soviet trade, our education system and all, and we were all very inward looking, 
So while uh, India and a lot of Indian people went abroad, and that is one of our greatest strengths, the non-resident Indians, which are all over the world, the lack of global exposure for so many, so many years for a majority of our Indians is a cause of concern, and the management institutes can play a very large role, especially with tying up with other U.S. universities and global universities to try to bring global practices more and more to the larger populace of the country. Uh, another question which has come up, uh, raised by at least half a dozen or more participants, uh, broadly in the field of education. And there are three uh, questions that are being posed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to summarize a range of complex questions. First is, you are an advocate of private education. Uh, what do you see are the potentials of private education, given the numbers are so large and private opportunities are so few? Secondly, along with that, is the question of what do you see as the key challenges of education? And finally, India has two distinct uh, methods of uh, uh, education, what is being described by the questioner as modern and uh, ancient. How do, how do the two mesh? Okay. For education, you know, uh, the background and the basis of a progress of a nation really depends on the educative ability of its people. The United States has grown so well because it has one of the world's best educational uh, institutions and universities. In India, we have 21 million people being born every year. The total number of people who go to higher education is about 3.5 million. But out of that 3.5 million, about 3.2 million are doing what is called rote learning a British imposed educational system that uh, was meant for a slave mindset that did not allow for questioning mind, that does not apply for, uh, allow for opening, uh, you know, your mindset to people. And therefore, we have a very strong challenge to re redo this. Unfortunately, most of these uh, universities and colleges are owned by the government, uh, and therefore, there is very little will to change. So the privatization will bring in new concepts and new thought processes and innovation and creativity into the educational system, which is so vibrant and so easily visible in all uh, universities, led by Harvard, of course, which, where I'm sitting, which is leading in that innovation and the quality and creativity of its uh, student uh, body. And that's what we really need. Again, another question uh, on uh, education. Uh, here uh, it comes from uh, from India, and he's asking is as to why the Indian industry is not making more use of Indian talent. Well, uh, there are uh, hardly any foreigners working in India. Very few. We would like more to come in, but at the moment. Most of the Indian enterprises, including those of the multinationals, are actually being uh, managed and run by Indian uh, people. So, but there is a lack of talent in India now because we've grown so fast that uh, we really need a lot more managers and therefore we can attract a lot more foreign talent also to come in, in, into India as well. But obviously we are using, uh, Today, one of the very interesting uh, dichotomies of the country is that Indian industry is saying that their constraint, the biggest constraint to growth is neither money nor infrastructure nor even corruption in government. It is lack of available talent. And that's quite surprising for a nation that has so much population and so much unemployment as well. But really, globally qualified talent is what we really need a lot more of. Thank you, Vilay. Uh, you, you mentioned about corruption, and again, so let me pick on that because I can see at least four, que four questioners asking the same thing. Uh, they are concerned about the corruption in India, and they are asking, as, uh, let me quote from Deepthi, who says, uh, how can India work on its huge corruption level? See, corruption in India has to be looked at in a different light from that in the United States, you know. When, uh, and I gave this example very interestingly, when you give a peon, you know, 10 cents so that, you know, he'll send your, uh, your card in to the officer and the clerk sitting outside takes another 20 bucks so that he can put your file up to him. Uh, you have to understand that 
we don't view that as corruption because the salaries in India are so low. The president of India gets a salary of uh, something like seven hundred dollars a month. And because he is the president, every government officer below that has to be paid less, you know, because he is the highest officer in the country. So the prime minister gets paid maybe six fifty dollars. The cabinet ministers get paid six hundred dollars. Secretaries to the government get paid five hundred dollars, and down the line. So you know, it's so pathetic. I had a cousin of mine, and uh, she was also uh, qualified from MIT. And when she came back home, she was my neighbor. And uh, you know the electricity in her house used to go off uh, very often, not in my house. And I told her, why don't you pay this uh, guy, you know, ten dollars a month, and you, are, you will not have any electricity problems. And she says, no, it's my fundamental right to do so. So she went up to the chief minister, the chief minister sent her to the chairman of the board, and the chairman of the board told her very frankly, she said, he said, look, you know, I can fire this guy, I can remove him from this post and all. But this guy is only asking for ten dollars, you know, and he gets paid so little. So isn't it better if you just pay it to him, and you know things will be much easier for you, for me, and for everybody else. And she paid, and she had uh, no problems later on. Now, do you call this corruption? I don't. You know, it's just a way of enhancing the salaries of the government people when their uh, salaries are so pathetically small. And business does not look at it as a stumbling block. You know. So while we do talk about corruption, I don't think uh, it is in any way, you know, restricting our growth or restricting our ability to grow. Uh, Vinay, there is another set of questions that are coming up, and and this seems to be on the minds of many many Americans. Uh, jobs are being outsourced uh, from the United States to India. Uh, uh, I will quote from one questioner, but this, uh, others have also asked this question. Uh, Sneha from, I, I believe from India, uh, is asking what American sectors will lose their jobs as uh, globalization and outsourcing continues? No nation ever loses jobs because of technological advancement. And when you remove uh, boundaries, you know, uh, in a global world, there are no jobs being lost. You know, when there was the railroad, or when there was not even the automobile, and when the automobile came in, people said jobs will be lost because no longer you need all these uh, rickshaw pullers and all. When the airplanes came, they said, you know, uh, the railroads will lose jobs. When manufacturing uh, started coming in, they said the people who spin the wheel and, uh, you know, make cloth by hand are going to lose jobs. But technology has never stopped, you know, and everybody has always been employed at all times. It's only in a depression in a whole country that, uh, you know, some jobs, uh, you know, some people get unemployed. But every time, you know, some things move, there are other new jobs and new opportunities that keep getting created. Uh, when the Internet came and all, people thought uh, the world was useless paper, but surprisingly with all the Internet and everybody being uh, live on uh, the net and reading through the net, there is still more paper produced and more paper printed than later uh, otherwise. So I don't believe that U.S., uh, you know, they might lose some low-end jobs, but they'll create more jobs through more innovation and more creativity. And U.S. is therefore the land of opportunity because they have a global outlook on life, and that's why they have progressed. And Europe, which has had more inward-looking policies of trying to protect jobs, has actually fallen down the ladder. So I don't believe an inward-looking policy would ever help a nation. Thank you, Vinay, again. Let me now try to sum up uh, about four or five questions, all related to India and China. Uh, several questioners are asking, what are the, some of the challenges and threats that uh, you see India faces from uh, China? You talk of uh, US, uh, uh, India being a counterpoise to China uh, in its strategic relationship with the United States. What do you think the United States can do for India uh, if there were a confrontation uh, uh, with uh, uh, China? And the, another question related to China is, as Chinese learn English, what would be India's comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis China? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Uh, to start with the first, uh, China will remain a very dominant power 
in the 21st century. There's no doubt about it. The only question mark on China sometimes is that as China uh, people grow, get more wealth and become wealthier and wealthier, there may be and will be obviously a call for freedom. And at that time, they would want uh, the right to vote, the right to speak, the right to say what they want. And that could lead to a disastrous situation like that happened in Russia. And that is something nobody can really predict. So there is a very big question mark as to when the people will rise. Today, it is an authoritarian government. And therefore, they quell all kinds of dissent and you know force people to work the way, increase productivity, everything. But handling a free nation is a very, very difficult task. As the United States also knows, you know, and the presidents of the United States know very well that they really can't push down policy down everybody, anybody's throat. They have to work in a very, very democratic and time-consuming manner. So that's the one thing. As far as India and China are concerned, I think uh, now both nations have realized that there's really no point of a dispute on border and everything. And that status quo almost is being accepted by both nations. Both nations can prosper very well, and uh, therefore we had a visit of the Chinese premier to India and the Indian prime minister going there. Both nations are looking at trade with each other as a very positive effect, and that will continue to grow. So India and China will be very large trading partners. Of course, Indian interests lie more with the United States, and the United States more with India, I presume, and I, I predict that, because both of us share more shared values of democracy, of free enterprise, as I said earlier. And that is where India and the United States will come in a lot more uh, uh, because of the shared values, which I believe is very much integral to the psychic of both the American people and the Indian people. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Uh, you have talked a great deal about shared values uh, between the United States and India. So this prompts me to uh, 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 repeat a question being asked by uh, Lekhaj Sajwan. He says there's a, there's a lot of com com uh, commonality between India and the U.S. And there's a lot of differences between the U.S. and China. Yet China, Chinese bus uh, American businessmen time and again prefer the Chinese to India. That's right because it's so much easier to take, deal with a dictatorship and United States business people and multinationals have always found it so much easier to deal with authoritarian governments anywhere around the world, whether it was Korea or Taiwan or Singapore or China now, because the permissions and all are so much easier. When you go to China, you in one shot you can get all the permissions because the prime minister or somebody top down can say, give them all the permissions if they need the land, they'll just say, take the land. And if there are people to be uprooted, it can be done overnight, right? And nobody will ask questions. In India, there are the Indian courts, the people, the state government, the local municipalities, and uh, this thing. And it's a horrendous task to get all the permissions through. So China is a much easier place to do business with from a multinational uh, point of view. And that is why, very interestingly, FDI goes to China because the multinationals want to find it an easy way to do it. but. Mutual funds and provident funds and uh, non-direct investment comes to India. In the last five years, uh, mutual funds and the provident funds have invested $68 billion in the Indian equity market, and their current worth is $350 billion. So they have made a 100% return on their investment every year. So it's five times what uh, they invested. And that is why India will get the, uh, you know, the investors from all over the world and the people's investments coming directly to India, and the multinationals for low-cost production will go to China. In fact, the Indian enterprise are now saying that, well, if the Chinese want to uh, produce at such a massive rate and low-cost production, even the Indian companies will use the Chinese manufacturing base for the low-cost manufacture, exactly as the uh, U.S. companies are doing. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, 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 one more question. Uh, I, will, I will again try to... Uh, lump several uh, uh, questions into one. There's a lot of uh, participants today are asking about India-US nuclear uh, uh, treaty. And, and the question uh, being asked is, uh, the treaty is extremely unpopular uh, in India. And if Indians cannot deliver this treaty to the United States, 
how 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 do you think the strategic relationship will develop well from my point of view the treaty the nuclear treaty is actually very good for both india and the united states and uh, we must understand that the united states also has bent backward in accommodating india as a nuclear superpower and still accepting it and going away from the nuclear disarmament treaty and everything else and therefore it's a huge thing the united states has given up in accommodating india because it wants to engage with india in a very large way when you say that the nuclear treaty is unpopular in india it is actually unpopular only with the communists you know and the communist party because of its links to china is trying to sabotage this uh, treaty because chinese people feel that india and united states coming greater together with each other is not in the strategic interests of china so the communist party is today in a very strong controlling position because it uh, can uh, you know actually this destabilize the government and therefore they are really putting all their pressure into trying to get this nuclear deal sabotaged but i do believe when you go through and the congress government the government in power today has put all their bets on it and saying that they will make it go through it is in the strategic interest of india to go through with the nuclear treaty uh, mr surender surender pal singh uh, uh, responded to your comments by asking uh, what are the long term benefit for india for this treaty see uh, we must understand that uh, one of the biggest concerns for india also is its environment we have a very polluted environment and we therefore need alternate sources to energy thermal energy because coal is one of the biggest pollutants and the co2 emissions are really messing up the global environment including that of india and for us the options are very small the uh, thing to you know water is uh, very difficult again because of the environmental issues associated with so much displacement of uh, resources uh, people and uh, you know the environment and therefore we can either go for solar energy or we can go for nuclear energy because oil we don't have very, very much of and we have to import so we have to find alternate sources and nuclear is one of the safest sources and a clean source of energy so it's very important for india to go for nuclear energy and we cannot go through with it without the nuclear treaty because we don't get access to the technology uh, thank you zine i will now move away from this larger strategic uh, questions and go back to what is uh, one of our primary focus today the state of education in india uh, mr zulfi hazar uh, who is a, a mason fellow from india at harvard he is asking that in the 60s and the 70s uh india used to uh, afford higher education to lots of students from africa asia and other parts of asia today sadly it doesn't happen uh, anymore uh is there any reason why uh, fewer uh, people from africa and asia are coming to or and is this an indication of the decline in the quality of education in india no our trouble is that more and more people from india are wanting uh, good quality education and we have just too few seats for too many aspirants and therefore you know uh, the cut off levels in some of the universities at an iit or an iim is like 99.9 percentile in even the, the colleges in delhi university is over 90 percent you know if you don't get at uh, 90% you don't get a seat in delhi university in mumbai university is exactly the same so the cut off points have become so ridiculous that it's uh, becoming extremely extremely competitive and therefore you know maybe the people from uh, you know africa and other places are not able to get that kind of marks because we have a uniform system that says you know it will be on the basis of uh, cut off of marks thank you and i will uh, stick to more questions and uh, questions are fast pouring in on uh, not, uh, education uh several of the participants are quite convinced that the future of uh, india lies in harnessing its uh, its knowledge and knowledge system education system in a, in, a, in an economy based on knowledge there is no escape from it yet uh, several participants are pointing out that indian higher education institutions are scarcely meeting 
the demand for trained people in 2007. Uh, whereas by 2015, by all projections, uh, I am told, uh, the demand will be uh, so excessive that India will not uh, be able to meet that demand, and India will cease to be the preferred destination for American outsourcing. Well, to some extent, that is our biggest challenge, actually, because as you know, and you have rightly pointed out, in a knowledge uh, global economy, it is the people's game. And people's skills, ability, and creativity is what will lead to any nation progressing very strongly. And yes, we had a huge uh, reservoir of people when the, our growth rates were very small. Uh, and we thought we had a great reservoir of unlimited uh, talent. But it took just five years of rapid growth to blow that myth away. And today, uh, every uh, company in India is finding itself short of people. And uh, the projections by industry are so alarming that to make anybody just uh, give them sleepless nights. Unfortunately, as I said, the government is moving too slowly on it. And government today controls 99% of the educational uh, institutions in the country. So it is very, very critical. That's why I said that they have to have more progressive uh, policies to bring in private sector into education. Because whatever they do, this year they have doubled their budget on education, uh, actually tripled it uh, in some areas. And yet we are grossly short. So we really do need a lot more money and investment going into education. And you are right in saying, otherwise we'll uh, miss the boat and others will catch up, including China with this English language that they're teaching uh, English. But it takes a couple of generations you know, to learn the language in a way that you can slate yourself into a very innovative nation. And we've had uh, more than three centuries of English language with us. Thank you. Uh, but I need to ask you more questions on the same uh, subject, because uh, more and more people uh, want to know. Rupa uh, 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 has just sent this question saying, uh, there seems to be an explosive situation uh, in India. Uh, primary uh, education is in a mess. Uh, how do we get out of this uh, uh, situation? Uh, and how do we harness our human resources? Well, the shocking part is that when you look at all the statistics, it's the fact that our education system, both at primary, secondary, and higher education, is in a total mess and a total collapse. And then you wonder how this crazy nation still grows at 9% in spite of all these problems. So the problems are real. Uh, the solutions are not easy at all. And it's going to take a while for uh, our people to be able to harness that ability in a very large way. But uh, it's, you know, uh, government and private sector is pitching in. And what industry is doing is most of the industries are now setting up their own educational institutions and their own schools and training colleges and everything to be able to do that. Reliance Retail, for instance, is looking at one million people to hire in the next five years in just retail. And they said, okay, we'll do it by ourselves, you know. Infosys is training 5,000 to 10,000 software engineers every year by themselves because they don't find enough people coming out. So industry is stepping in to put this thing. So in some ways, privatization is already taking place. If it is more rapid, we will grow more rapidly. So India's challenge, I think a lot of the question pe people have rightly put it, that it is actually the biggest stumbling block is educating our people in a global environment. I, again, uh, I'm very mindful of the fact that our time is uh, quite short. And therefore, I'm again trying to uh, bunch together a number of questions. Uh, one of the areas that at least six or seven questions have come up is on the question of terrorism. And, but the question, let me link it. The, the, what I think the primary concern of the participants is the que terrorism will distract from India's development. And at the same time, several of the participants are saying that uh, terrorism is uh, not only a, 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 a security uh, uh, threat, but also arises from the vulnerabilities of the poor, the marginalized, and the groups that have been excluded. How 
does uh, the Indian economy propose to deal with that problem? See, terrorism is something, you know, it started uh, during partition because of Kashmir, so we had the Islamic terrorism uh, thrown out of Pakistan with the support of some of the Middle East states to try to create trouble for India to be able to, you know, disrupt it enough that they would give up Kashmir and, uh, you know, give it to Pakistan. So it started that way, and then it just took on tones of, you know, just uh, a mafia kind of a situation of extortion and uh, things like this. It is not really based on too much real uh, religious differences or basic fundamental differences uh, in the way India should be or in the way Indian people want it to be. And uh, in little, little pockets it exists, but it exists anywhere in the world. So if you read the newspapers, you would think the whole country is burning up. But if you go, you know, in any of the cities, you'll never ever really see the face of it because it's in a large country. It is limited to some very, very few areas and to a few people. And the Indian people have become resilient to it and are able to deal with it reasonably well. As far as foreign investment is concerned, Somehow it doesn't seem to be bothering them because every year we keep getting more and more investments. And look at it one way. Today, when national boundaries have gone away, the money with the mutual funds and the provident funds, all the American people's, uh, average American person's money is in the mutual funds and provident funds. And these, uh, the people want a reasonable, decent return on their money, which is at least 10% or more. And how do you get them a 10% return when the economy is in, like United States is growing at only 2.3%, those in Europe are you know even more flat or uh, just about the same. So you have to invest in more dynamic economies which are growing more faster because people are today chasing even the whiff of growth. And in India there is more than a whiff of growth. So you will get investment and all over the world, I mean it didn't stop the American people going west with all the wild west, there were opportunities so the American people went and there was a lot of, uh, you know, problems out there, but they encountered it and, uh, you know, kept uh, countered it. So it will happen the same way in India. So we should not get overtly worried about the terrorism because uh, you read much more about it in the papers than you see it actually in real life. Thank you, Vinay. I, I think uh, many people uh, will take heart from your uh, uh, comments on uh, terrorism. I think. Uh, even though our time is uh, very uh, limited now, it would be unfair to end the, uh, uh, the discussion without a question that seems to be bothering a very large number of participants uh, today. Uh, you did, in your introductory comment, talk about two Indias. Uh, the celebrated Indian writer Pankaj Mishra has been also talking of tale of uh, 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 to uh, India. And there is a concern that the, the India that Tom Friedman visited and wrote about in his uh, book, uh, The World is Black, really reflects not even 20% of India, less, less than 20% of India. The vast majority of India live, uh, live in uh, poverty, in squalor, in deprivation, in ignorance, in illiteracy. Uh, how how fair it is to talk about? Uh, this is not to demean India's spectacular growth. Uh, that India is making progress. The world has seen. India has become the corporate destination for the whole world. But can India really achieve the status? of a global big power, if not a superpower, that it so richly deserves and aspires without addressing the other India, the India of 80%, India of ignorance, India of poverty, India of unemployment. It's a very good question and a good question to close it with, but I'll just quote you from uh, Sonia Gandhi, the leader of uh, the current government and leader of the Congress Party. When she talks about uh, India uh, being a superpower, she says we look at uh, a superpower as one where we cater to the well-being of all our citizens and to the happiness and wants of all our citizens. 
and that is what India is aspiring for. That is what India wants: superpower, not in uh, stature of being a military power, but superpower in terms of being one which looks and focuses on its people and uh, well-being of all its people. And that's a big challenge. But as you know, as an economist and uh, as a country, a free nation, that you can only first create wealth and then distribute wealth. You cannot distribute poverty. So unfortunately, there are no shortcuts to growth and to well-being. Yes, there are lots of problems. But one of India's greatest strengths is that the Indian people are giving the government and its own society time to grow and time to come out of it. And that is our fundamental belief in our philosophy of destiny and karma that keeps us united together and saying, yes, we will all look out for a better future, if not for ourselves, but for our children. And that resilience and that patience is something that is unbelievable. It is not there in America, so it's very difficult for Americans to understand how can Indian people be patient enough to say, if not for us, maybe a better future for our children. And that is a psychic of the Indian people that will help it grow. And therefore, we are patient enough to say that let the wealth be created and be reasonably distributed. The government policies are such that 90% of their budget outside of the defense budget goes into meeting the needs of the poor and industry and the wealthy are not complaining at all. In fact, they are pitching in with their own NGOs and uh, with their own charitable organizations and philanthropic organizations to make it an inclusive India. And inclusive India as a growth is something which is a bigger challenge for us in India than just being a superpower. Superpower for us means when it's the well-being of all, not a military superpower. Uh, Vinay, again, again, thank you. But still, another uh, 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 follow-up question has arisen. Uh, it would be unfair to end it without giving airing that question. Uh, India, you are quite right that India has the difficult charge, challenge of managing the transition, uh, where it needs heavy growth at the same, uh, fast and rapid growth at the same time, to focus on the question of distribution, which is not always uh, easy and and even uh, and it is time consuming, no doubt. But the questioner uh, asks that India was the home of the affirmative action. Affirmative action did much to promote uh, India's uh, uh, growth and development. How, how come uh, the affirmative action is uh, under attack and is being now rolled back instead of uh, at a time of huge inequality uh, being further strengthened uh, through various other uh, uh, mechanism, not only the existing, but I mean, uh, the, the question is, how do you broaden the opportunities of affirmative action? We have not given up affirmative action at all. The question is, we learned through our uh, tilt with the uh, Soviet Union and our brush with communism and state-controlled enterprise that rather than create wealth, it was actually uh, destroying wealth and destroying productivity, destroying uh, people's innovation and creativity. And therefore, uh, the people were actually becoming poorer and poorer. And we were having equality, but having more and more people poorer than richer. Right? And uh, so it was a crazy way to do things. And now we are creating wealth. And obviously, it's a slow process of uh, you know sending them across and uh, widely distributing it. But that's the only way. And the world, through its own experience in the last 100 years, have found that communism and socialist uh, uh, you know, created state enterprises do not work to create wealth. And therefore, we have to go the democratic way. And the democratic way is always very difficult. Yes, there will be more hands initially in the hands of a few, but in, over a period of time, as the United States has also learned, it does get distributed. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts to progress. And, you know, there is no RL answer to that. Thank you, Vinay. Thank you for answering these questions so candidly and so frankly. Uh, but before we end, and I pass it on to Jim, there is one final question I cannot resist uh, 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 asking. Shilpa is asking, what do Americans find most frustrating and confusing about India? Well, they find the country impossible to understand because in America, everything is uniform. You go from the East Coast to the West Coast for 3,000 miles, and it's still the same country and the same people, and you'll get still the same answers and still the same hamburgers, 
in India, the country changes every 20 miles, you know, and it's so frustrating to understand. You know, like Americans say there is an Indian curry. There is nothing called an Indian curry. It changes <laughs> every home, you know, and there is not and nothing called an Indian psychic, and there is nothing called an Indian way of doing business. So it's so frustrating to land up in a country where you know nothing about, and it might take you your entire lifetime to understand, you know. So it is a very frustrating country from that. It is more diverse than all of Europe put together and perhaps even Africa and South America. And when you take all this and you say, well, I want to have one policy for it all, there is no way it's going to work. So it's the American people who will have to understand that they're dealing with many, many, many countries inside the country. It's all great opportunities, but they have to understand the way. And the only uniform thing is our philosophy, but everything else is completely diverse and opposing each other, really. So you would say, is this country not crazy? And I say, yes, it's a crazy country, but it's a great country to be with, and it's a great country to prosper and create wealth. Thank you, Vinay. We are going to conclude now, but before you go away, may I say a, a few things. First, once again, truly, I'm very, very grateful that you were uh, able to join us. Second, a, a really a profound and a sincere apology. I don't think we did full justice to all the questions uh, that you were asking. Well, o uh, well over uh, 50 questions were sent in. I tried to lump them together, uh, knowing full well I was not doing justice to your uh, uh, profound questions. But I hope, this is our first of many discussions, I hope you will come back, and I hope next time we will be able to answer your questions uh, uh, better. My colleague uh, Jim will say a few words, and also to remind you, you will get, us, uh, get an email from us, and I hope we can engage you in, uh, in future uh, discussions and meetings. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Gaur. Uh, thank you, Gaur. And um, I would just like to uh, remind everybody that we're hosting a post-event chat where you can log into a text-based chat room and continue to discuss these issues. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. Um, I also just want to remind you that this event was recorded and we're going to be posting that on the Government Innovators Network website. So in the email that you receive from us in a day or two, um, we're going to give you a link to that recording. So you can listen to the event again at your leisure. Um, the way you want to get to the chat room, and I'm going to share my browser window with you, is to go to the Government Innovators Network, and that is at www.innovations.harvard.edu. And that website looks like this. And then you're going to want to go to the right-hand side of the screen. And under the section titled Spotlights, this is the second Spotlight section, you'll see a picture of Dr. Rai, and the title is Think India Post-Event Chat Room. You're going to want to click on that link, and then you come up to this login screen, and you simply type in your name, and click Sign In. And at that point, you'll be in the chat room, and you can begin typing your initial comments. Once you've logged in, you can also close out Microsoft Live Meeting. You don't need to have Live Meeting open in order to chat. And that concludes our event today. Uh, thank you to everyone for participating, and we hope to see you in the chat room. Thank you. Thank you.